Good morning, coaches. For those of you that do not know me, my name is Daniel Cavalcanti. I am the director of coaching for Joga Bonito Futsal Academy. It's a futsal academy here in South Florida in the United States. And it's a great honor and a great privilege to be here with you today for actually for a couple of reasons. Um, the first of all, because I believe that I am living proof of one of the higher purposes that we are trying to achieve here with Team Cabeza and with the uh, International Conference for, for Futsal Coaches. What do I mean by that? What do, I, what do I mean by I'm living proof? Because one of our purposes, uh, one of our main missions, it's not just expose um, youth coaches to, to some amazing information, some incredible content that is out there from some of the best minds in Futsal um, throughout from all over the world, but also to provide a platform for lesser known coaches, uh, youth coaches, which is the vast majority of coaches that work with futsal, they're involved with the youth sector, to provide these coaches with a voice, um, a voice where they are actually heard. Uh, quite often, we, we observe the conversation taking place. We, 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 we listen to what's being said, but we are, our voice doesn't have the reach that we would like for it to have. We do not have a, um, we do not participate at the conversation at a higher level, if I'm making myself clearly. Meaning, you know, the conversation that actually determines where the sport needs to go and what needs to happen. So part of our project here is to make sure that, that youth coaches do have that platform. Um, I believe, and all the other founding members of Team Cabeza and all the people that are behind this conference, we all believe that, there's, that there are many incredible qualified coaches out there that do a fantastic job uh, within their club, um, inside their community, in their region, and, and they have some incredible content that, and knowledge that, that could be shared with all of us. So for that reason, I am, I'm very grateful to be here. If you, if you have done the subscription to the conference and you have access to the, to the conference's Facebook page, you will see that each morning we are uploading um, pre-recorded uh, presentations, but presentations that were created specifically for this conference for, uh, that were created by youth coaches. So that's one way that they are sharing a little bit of their knowledge and a little bit of what they do well, with the world. And, and in the YouTube page, there is up to four or five content from Brazilian youth coaches that are having the opportunity to do, to do the same thing. And the second reason why it's a, it's a privilege for me to be here today is because of the content. The content was not created by me. Um, the content was actually covered in yesterday's opening um, lecture by Coach Vanildo Neto. Coach Vanildo Neto is the U20 national team coach for Brazil for futsal. So incredibly large shoes to fill to be able to bring that message, um, even if it's just in a simplified form, but to be able to bring that message into English so you have access to it as well. And, and the content is actually quite personal to me because I have experience with it. It is something that I came across about a year and a half when I first got to know Coach Neto's work. And I actually acquired one of his eBooks regarding um, sec the, the game in sectors. It was more specifically, specifically geared towards defense. And upon acquiring the content, uh, I immediately realized that this was something that could be useful in the academy at Joga Bonito, where I currently work. And so we did. We took some of those concepts and we started implementing and experiencing, uh, 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 creating an experiment within our club. And within months, the results, the results were very visible. And when, and when I say results, I mean results, not just um, game results and competition results, tournament results. Yes, they were, they, they were there as well but results in regards to the child's understanding of the game and recognizing the, dis the different sectors of the court and knowing how to, to which behavior is ideal for that given sector. So that it's, uh, it's something that's personal to me. I have some experience with the content. So when I acquired it about a year and a half ago, never did I imagine that I will be presenting about it today. So for me, it's an, it's an honor, it's a privilege. And I thank everybody that's coming here. I know we have viewers we have um, English-speaking coaches that, that, that are part of the conference that are from all over the world, from the United States, from England, from Iran, from Japan, uh, from Australia. So to be able to share some of that knowledge with you uh, is incredible. Um, the topic, the game in sectors. Before I begin, 
I think it's important for me to mention that just because I am presenting it, just because Coach Neto presented it yesterday, that doesn't mean that everything that I'm going to say here is absolute truth. We actually encourage you guys to, to question things. We encourage you to, to be skeptical. But at the same time, try to take something away, something that you might feel that you feel can be beneficial to your club and experiment with it just as I did in your own environment. So question it. Don't, don't trust everything you see or that you hear, but take what you can, experiment within your club and see what happens because maybe that is the key to success. No, you, you take something that somebody created, develop, and then you bring parts of it into your own environment and then you develop your own system or your own model from there. And then we'll begin. We'll begin here with the content. Okay, so the gaming sectors. Again, the, co the content is by Coach Fanyu Neto. I'm going to do my best to bring it to you in English. Okay, so I want to start with this model right here. This model has actually, been, has actually been around for a long time. This is not a creation. This is not our creation. Um, this is not Coach Neto's creation. This is a model that has been around for, for as long as I can remember, uh, probably much longer than, than I was around. And it's been used by many successful coaches throughout the years. And it's, it's still used by some of those very uh, successful coaches that have won many tournaments, many championships, and compete at a high level. Uh, over here you have, so for example, with this traditional model, you have your four lines of defense, line one, line two, line three, and line four. Line one being the line close to the opponent's goal, and line four being the one closest to your goal. And dividing the court into three zones is something that it's not new that we're creating. This has also been around for many, for many, many years, dividing the zone into one, two, and three. Zone number one being the zone close to our goal, zone number two being the middle zone, number three, and zone number three being at the offensive third. No? So this is something that Coach Neto was mentioning yesterday, that he's, you know, he's been coaching for over 20 years, and for many years he did use this model for, for coaching. But then in conversation with his peers, he realized that many of the youth athletes, um, while this was working very good for the, for the high level, for the elite, elite, for the professional players, the youth players were having a little bit of difficulty understanding their place in this in this model, um, partly because the lines, the lines of defense for kids, they might seem like very specific spots on the court. You know, so, for example, there is no line one point five. There's no line two point five. It's line one, line two, line three and line four. And added to that, give, uh, given the reality of youth futsal, not just in Brazil, but also in the United States and I'm sure in other countries as well. Uh, children are always playing in different courts. You're playing in basketball dimension courts. You're, and then the next weekend you play in a much bigger court. And then you go to the next game and it's a court that is even smaller than a basketball court. So for kids to identify those exact lines, a total of four lines with uh, an environment that's constantly changing proved to, be, proved to be very challenging. And to add to that even more, line one, for example, ever since the rules of the game changed, and the goalkeeper can now throw the ball over the halfway court. Um, for many of the coaches, they started abolishing line one altogether because it made no sense for a player to go defend, uh, to, for you to post players to defend all the way up in line one, and then the goalkeeper throws the ball, and then all those players have to sprint back to get behind the ball. So many coaches were already only working with three lines of defense given that, that rule change. Um, and again, the zones were always there, zones one, two, three. And I guess the challenge here that, that Coach Neto was mentioning is that it maybe it was a little bit too abstract um, and maybe it wasn't concrete enough for kids to relate to it. Um, remember, you have to come into this with the mindset of a child. So anything that we can use from the outside world that the that, that child can relate to that's going to help them develop a better understanding of the game is good. And then, so what, what Coach Neto was, was saying that he then decided that, okay, I'm going to create something different um, to work with the youth ages. But I want to maintain some aspects of the older model because we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, there are some very good things about the older model, but I want to create something new and I want to create something new, but I still want to keep the main references of the game. And what are the main references of the game? It's the ball. Every player, regardless of age, can relate to the ball. Everybody wants the ball. Um, the half court line, because for, for anybody that plays the game, it's an easy distinction. Um, we usually have an offensive behavior once we've crossed the, half, the, the halfway line. Behind the halfway line, that's more of a, a cautious defensive behavior. So half court is a, a, is a convenient and it's a useful reference. And the goal, 
the goal is also something that everybody can relate to. I want to protect my goal and I want to score on the opponent's goal. So we want to keep some of the elements from the older model and we want to keep the references of the game. And then what, what was the final, the, the, where the final switch went off uh, in his mind was that he was attending a lecture by one of the, one of uh, a very renowned futsal coach in Brazil and Coach Neto was at a lecture and the coach was speaking about the, how, how futsal is chaotic. And he was speaking about the theory of chaos. And he presented a clip that it was in an Asian or a foreign country. I'm not sure where it was, if it was in, in Singapore, in, in Vietnam, but, or in India, but it was a, at a traffic stoplight. And it was very, there was no, no, no signal, no, no stoplight. And it was at an intersection. And it seemed very chaotic. You know, cars were weaving in and out, trucks were weaving in and out, bicycles, motorcycles going into each and every direction. But within that chaos, no accidents were taking place. So there must be some kind of structure, some kind of, um, some kind of structure within that chaos. And, and he was discussing that within the theory of chaos, uh, due to the repetition of some, uh, uh, some lots of repetition of some scenarios, um, the theory of chaos was not completely chaotic and everything wasn't going to, to, to shamble. So, so when Coach Neto was observing that, he was observing that intersection, intersection, and if he was saying, okay, if this is a game of futsal, what can I do at this intersection that's going to help kids? And then he came up with the, with the, with the stoplights, with something very simple, something that kids can relate to, the most kids before they even start the practice of any sport they're already familiar with the concepts of a red light yellow light green light there are even you know some some uh games f in physical education classes in school that are taught as early as you know pre-k so he said what if i take that and i incorporate that into the zones maybe that will help kids. that'll maybe that's going to be something a little bit more concrete that that the kids can identify with and then this is what he came up with um, the zones by by color. So he basically took the lines of defense out and he maintained the three zones from the original model. And then he gave, instead of naming them zone one, zone two, zone three, or defensive third, uh, offensive third, he gave each zone a color. So the defensive third is the red zone. The middle third is the yellow zone. And the green third is the offensive, is the, pardon me, is the green zone. And with each color, not only did he give each zone a color, but he also gave, gave each zone a cue, one cue for offense and one cue for defense. Now you may be asking me, what's a cue? So a cue is a verbal or a sensory trigger to generate behavior. So for example, if he's uh, training his team on how to better defend in the red zone, what are some, cue, uh, some key words, some cues, some verbal cues that he can use to remind his players that they are in the red zone? And in the red zone, we want to... We, we want to play, we want to generate a certain behavior, individual behavior and collective behavior. Um, and the same thing for offense. When we were playing out the back and when I'm doing training exercise in this specific zone, what are some of the words that I can use that I can repeat over and over in training that it's going to help them immediately? As soon as they listen to that word, it's going to associate with that zone and they know how we want them to, to perform. Um, so he gave each zone a color and each zone a cue for both offense and for defense because the end goal for him was to generate behavior and why is it important to generate behavior because it's the force of habit um we like to say that in futsal and that in soccer it's important for a player to be smart to think but perhaps in futsal and even in soccer it's it's more important for a player to play with intuition um and that only happens if it's uh if it's part of your behavior if you've done it enough times where you no longer think about it so I'll give you an example. If you are driving a car, when you drive a car, you don't have to think about when to pump the brakes. You don't have to think about when to accelerate, when to turn on the left signal, and so on, when to put into a drive, when to put into a park. You just do it. So we don't. So what, what is the way that we can create that same kind of uh, behavior in futsal where the kids are working on, on automatic? We do not want to, we don't want to take, we do not want to take the creative process away but we do want them to be able to play. We don't, we, we don't want them to play slowly by thinking way too much. And added to that, those cues are all related to the logic of the game. So for example, when we discuss the logic of the game, what's the logic of the game for attack? It's to preserve the ball, 
once we have preserved the ball, now our priority is to progress the players and the ball towards the opponent's goal. If we have managed to do that, the next priority, the next logic of the game is to finish on target as quickly as possible. Um, the logic of the game for defense is to, we don't have the ball, so what do we want? We want to recover the ball. If we have not been able to recover the ball, what's the next step? Okay, let's inhibit the opponent in the ball of progressing toward my goal. And if we were not able to achieve that, then the next step in the logic of the game, okay, we need to protect my goal. Like I said, it's the logic of the game. It seems very logical, but how many times do we see children, youth futsal players in games and in practice, um, they have the opportunity, the opportunity to finish on goal, and instead of finishing on goal, they pass the ball backwards or they pass to somebody else. Um, or in a one on one, uh, they receive the ball with space ahead of them. And instead of progressing on the, on the terrain towards the opposing team's goal, they decide to dribble sideways or even backwards. So it seems like very logical things, but it's important for us to be aware of what they are and to transfer that understanding to the kids as well. So in our day to day, in our practices to be able to explain to them the logic of the game. What is our intent when we are attacking and what is our intent when we're defending? What should we always be looking to do? So if we can incorporate those zones by colors with the cues based on the logic of the game, then what Coach Neto uh, was trying to get at, okay, now I can, I, can, I can achieve a more efficient performance for my players by doing so. So now as we go into defense, um, before I even start presenting the zones and some of the behaviors and cues associated with those zones, it's important for me to remind you once again, I am going to present you with examples. These examples are not rules set in stone. These are some examples that have worked for Coach Neto, that have worked uh, at the academy that, that, that I work in, in our environment. But for you, you, for example, for a specific zone, if you, are, if you want to be develop a behavior for the green zone in offense, maybe the behavior that is best for your team, for your level of athletes, is different than what works for me. So I'm going to give some examples of, of what, worked, what, what has worked for us in the past, and then hopefully you'll be able to take something away and, and experiment with you inside your own environment. So in the green zone, when we are defending, um, what are some of the actions and the intentions of the defense for us in the green zone? So the intention is to disarm whoever has the ball. So over here, we want to pressure. We want to be um, very aggressive. Now, you may turn around and ask, okay, what if the player that, what if one of the, what if one of our players is excessively aggressive and gets beaten and now we suffer a defensive transition. The other team now has an offensive transition. They have a numerical advantage over us. They come at us with the four versus three. So in some research that Coach Neto did in Brazil by observing many, many games and, and writing things down, he started researching purposely this exact scenario, trying to figure out in competition when the first line of defense is broken, how often was the other team actually scoring a goal right away? And what he found out is that it, that it, it was rarely the case. Uh, in most opportunities, actually, in most occasions, actually, when that first line of defense was broken, when the player was being aggressive, trying to steal the ball in the green zone, the other team actually was not able to capitalize. One or two, two, one or two times, yes, but actually the opposite was occurring more often, where the person was stealing the ball or, or the, the player in possession of the ball made a bad pass and then the team intercepted and was able to score. So again, that is based on Coach Neto's research from his own environment, from the local and regional competition in his state. It doesn't mean that it's true worldwide, but it's something that gave him the confidence to adopt this playing style into the green zone. Um, so whoever's marking the player with the ball have the intent to disarm the player that has the ball. Um, the player that does not have the ball, if you have a second player in defense in that zone, your job is to inhibit the player without the ball from receiving it. So this is when those concepts of coverage are very important. You know, So if the player with the ball, as soon as he makes the pass to the other player, you have to be ready to make that run and inhibit that pass, the, that pass from taking place. Um, sometimes, actually, the intent of the two players that are in that zone are to put pressure, but to generate discomfort so that the player with the ball can make a bad decision and make a bad pass into the zone that's below, which would be the yellow zone. 
So for example, if you utilize a Y defense, um, the Y defense is basically the shape of the letter Y. You have two Y players um, over there in the green zone, putting pressure, one player floating around in the middle of the court, and then a further back player over in the red zone. So the intent of those two players at the top might be to generate enough discomfort so that whoever has possession of the ball in that area will play a, a poor ball into the yellow zone, and then you have your floating player there to intercept, almost like in American football, if you will, and, and, and produce a, a, an interception. So not everything has to be geared. Those two players, just because they are aggressive, that doesn't mean that they're always after the ball. Um, and then if you want to generate this kind of behavior in the green zone for your team in defense, then your training sessions have to be focused on inducing players to make, uh, uh, your defending players have to always be looking to induce whoever has the ball to make a bad decision, uh, making sure that the defense is always being aggressive, uh, aggressive in training sessions in that part of the court. Um, the coverage has to be on point, especially that timing of the coverage. And then the cue here is pressure. Again, so the cue, the coach, whenever you're doing your training sessions in this part of the court and you're working um, defense in the green zone, you want to use the word pressure a lot, pressure a lot, pressure a lot. So the kids will know uh, either of two ways. They will either know when you say pressure that they are probably in the green zone and they can pressure, or they will recognize themselves that they are in the green zone. And by being there, they would all automatically know that that is where they need to pressure. Um, one very important thing to mention here about the queue. When we say the queue, that doesn't mean that the coach has to be on the sideline of the game saying that word over and over again. Actually, it's the other way around. We, we want the player to, uh, we are creating this model so that the player can de depend less and less on the coach. Because if the player is generating a certain kind of behavior based on the zones, because we've done it enough to retraining, then the coach won't have to be standing up on the sideline to give those cues. The cues you give during the training sessions, once the behavior has been established, then the kids are ready to go and ready to give you the, the optimal um, response to, to the solutions in, in the game. Actions and intentions of the defense in the yellow zone. Um, this is a zone of acceleration and deceleration. This is a zone of transition. This is actually, uh, according to us, the zone that needs to be trained the most often because this is likely the part of the court where we will where our players will will spend the most time in during training um, actually during games so we want to make sure that in training we create a lot of situations that involve the yellow zone because this is where all of your transitions take place your offensive transitions and your defensive transitions most of them go through here um, so the intent of the defense in the yellow zone could be to decelerate, to not dive in. You want to have the patience to generate discomfort, to, gen to generate numerical advantage near the ball. So let's assume that we pressured high in the green zone. We were being very aggressive on the ball and we were not able to recover the ball. So now we track back to the yellow zone and our behavior cannot be the same now because what we want to do, if the defense doesn't have the ball, the next thing that the defense wants the most is time. So we did not get the ball in the green zone. Now we want time for our players to come back behind the ball and we can reorganize ourselves. We can start to create numerical advantage around the player that has the ball. So to be able to accelerate and have the patience to do that um, is very important. Now, one of the things that Coach Neto discussed yesterday was that in a conversation with Kaká, Kaká is the head coach for Kairach, which is one of the top professional teams in the world. It's a team out of a... Kazakhstan, uh, two-time European champions. And the head coach, Kaká, he actually has a different mindset in relation to the yellow zone. He was saying that in the yellow zone, he actually prefers, instead of um, decelerating, he likes to accelerate through individual marking, man-to-man -man marking, because he believes that if you give the player uh, time, while, uh, if you give the player time and space while we're trying to reorganize ourselves to, to create numerical superiority, a high level player will find a solution. And so from his point of view, he thinks that it's better to actually just have one player engage that player with the ball and be very aggressive. But then we have to remember that each person's reality. Coach Kaká, he is working with some of the best players in the world. So naturally, if you give the best players in the world time and space, they will find a solution. But 
for most of us with, uh, who work with youth futsal, that might not necessarily be the case. So again, just another example how there's no written rule, it's not set in stone. This is an example of what works for us, but I just gave you an example of what works for, for somebody else. Um, higher focus and emphasis in training in the zone. As I mentioned before, spend a lot of time here. This is where all your transitions um, often take place. So needless to say, when you are training the yellow zone, if you do not know how to train the yellow zone, one way for you to do it is through transition activities, your 3v2s, your four versus threes. And the cue that you can use during training here for the defense is to march. Why march? Because march is the halfway process between a full-blown stop and sprinting. So in this area, we're not fully stopped yet, but we're also not sprinting diving in. So during training, when we're working in this environment, we want to, while our defense is, is uncomfortable because it's probably under numerical disadvantage, we want to tell them to decelerate and march, march, march. So that's one of the key, one of the cues that Coach Neto uses. But again, the cues, um, you have to figure out what works the best for you, what kind of language you think that your kids will relate to. And now the red zone. Um, in the red zone, the desirable behavior is to stop in front of the player with the ball. So we were not able to recover the ball. We were not able to inhibit the other team from advancing in the terrain. So now, according, if you go back to the logic of the game, the next step is, okay, we have to protect our goal. So to protect our goal, we have to stop in front of the player with the ball. Um, avoid giving space and time for the player to, uh, for the player to think. Um, intelligent and skillful players will find a solution against zone defense at the youth level. Why do we say this? Some players, um, some coaches do a very fantastic job of defending, of organizing their teams to defend in this exact zone, either through a quadrante system or through a diamond shape. Um, but as good as you are, it's a, uh, a skillful player. If you give him enough time and space, going back to what Coach Kakao was actually talking about the yellow zone, he will find a, a solution here. So you want to stop in front of the player. And then once you have done that, you want to close your legs. Why do I say close the legs? It seems like a funny term. But how many times have we seen a player, uh, a defender, stand centered with the uh, attacker with the ball, with the legs wide open, and then the attacker with the ball, the player with the ball, toe pokes it into the goal, or manages to find a pass in between the player's legs. So that's why we want them to find that, that you want to do a lot of training. Um, for the players to do a proper defensive posture in front of the player with the ball so that their legs are not wide open in front of it. Um, induce the player. And then once you have done that, now we start inducing the player back to, to the yellow zone if possible. Um, and again, we say too much time in the zone can be mentally draining in a game. Um, an example of, of why it's good to always when we can't push the team back into the yellow zone is because some years ago, I don't know if you remember, Argentina had a, a, Argentina's professional team, men's team, had a game against Brazil, and they were winning, they went up 2-0. And as soon as they went up, they were doing pretty much a clinic on how to defend in the red zone. Brazil had all the ball possession, but they could not create any real goal scoring opportunities. They were not able to get a shot and roll. It was a true clinic. It was a, a masterpiece on how to defend in the red zone. But eventually, through a stroke of luck, um, a ball was deflected, a, a, a goal turned out, resulted because of it. The game was now 2-1. The momentum shifted. Um, mentally, it became uh, in favor of the Brazilian team, and Brazil went, ahead, uh, went on to win the game 3-2. So just going to show that staying too much in this area, no matter how well organized your team is and how prepared your team is to be in the zone, as soon as you've stopped in front of the player, okay, now let's try to induce them back into the yellow zone. Um, and whoever marks the player without the ball, you want to make sure that you follow that player, but you do not want to follow him too closely. You want to always try to congest the middle of the court as much as possible. Again, going back to the logic of the game, the priority here is to protect the goal. So to protect the goal, we have to protect the, that middle vertical lane of, of the court. So careful not to go to expand. We want to compact a little bit more. So one of the cues that Coach Neto uses in Brazil for his players is either say stop or close the legs. So as soon as the players hear that in training, they know that they're in the red zone. They 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 have a very low aggressive, uh, a very low defensive posture. They you know um, 
they're not flat-footed against the player. And then as soon as they, they're able to do that, they start trying to push the players back to, to the yellow zone. Um, I'm going to make one, one caveat here back to the yellow zone because one of the things, one of the situations that you can be aggressive here, however, that I didn't mention was if you notice, even though we talked about decelerating, but if you notice that a player, an offensive player, controls the ball poorly, either with a sideways body posture or with his back towards goal, then yes, you can be aggressive and you can you can adapt a green zone behavior in here. So just going back because it just uh, it just clicked that I forgot to mention that part when I was talking about the red zone. So again, red zone deceleration for us, but we always tell our players if you notice that the player received the ball with poor body posture, okay, capitalize on that. Let's be aggressive. Let's get them back to the green zone. And now we go to behaviors and cues for, for the attack. Again, I'm always being very careful to remind you, this is a model that works for us. You can take these colors if you're willing to experiment, experiment with it in your own club, and, and you can develop the, any pattern of behavior that you like and any cues that you like. But these are some of the examples that we found to be successful. Red zone. So now the red zone for offense. That means that third of the court next to our goal. Um, the cue for the zone during training sessions, um, if we want our teams to be productive here, to be efficient here, and we want to do a lot of possession games, a lot of interaction, um, constant movement. Um, but the main cue for us will be interaction. Get the players to understand that here over here, they need to interact because the other team is pressuring us and we need to find a way out. Um, whoever has the ball, find ways to dribble, find ways to pass, and a way to make sure that you're always capitalizing on those opportunities will be to keep your head up. So if a passing lane is available, you can take advantage of it right away. So we work that a lot during training. Every training session that we do here in the red zone for offense, making sure those kids have their heads up uh, uh, or generating or condition, condition to have their heads up. The body posture, every time we receive the ball, our body's facing forward as much as we can. Um, we do not want to keep that ball with our back towards the, the goal that we want to attack, because if they steal the ball, they can go straight to our goal. Um, so the body posture is very important. Also to capitalize on 1v1 opportunities. Um, if, if an opportunity is there for me to take in a defender on one-on-one -on -one because he has no coverage, but it would be a shame if I didn't capitalize on it because I received the ball with my body sideways. So the body posture is extremely important. Is it, it's important in all uh, throughout the whole game in all sectors of the in all zones of the court, but especially important here. And the feints, the feints, because sometimes um, the defense will do a good job of closing down the passing lanes, and the feints are a useful tool where you fake that you go to the left and you bring it to the right, and for a split second there or a little bit more, you've created a passing lane. There's an escape route. So encourage kids to perform feints in in this area. Whoever does not have the ball supports the player with the ball to generate numerical advantage. Again, your creation of triangles in this zone. This is a good zone for us to work the creation of triangles. Uh, again, going back to interaction. Um, and as comfortable as we are in this zone, just like we can be very comfortable in the red zone for defending, some teams are very comfortable in the zone or in the yellow zone with possession of the ball because they do a lot of rondos in training. If, you, if you're the kind of coach that does a lot of rondos in training and you have very technical players, sometimes that can be dangerous because the kids might develop a behavior where they like to keep the ball back here and they don't recognize the, the, the opportunity to move forward. So as soon as, the, as, soon as the, the, the opportunity is there for your team to progress to the next sector, which will be the yellow, in the quickest and best way possible, do it. We want to explain to kids that this is an area where it's necessary to have courage, um, but courage with responsibility. Be aware of where you are. Um, having said that, we do not want to instill fear in the player. Um, we want to potentialize the player. We do not want to instill fear here. How do I instill fear? How do I make my player afraid of, of playing in the zone? If I keep telling him in my training sessions over and over again that he's not allowed to dribble back here. Because if he dribbles back here and he loses the ball, then the other team gets to score a goal. So if I do that, now he has fear. And sometimes dribbling is the best option in this zone. Um, sometimes a pass down the middle, some, some coaches, I used to do it myself uh, a long time ago, 
where we used to tell players not to pass the ball uh, across the middle here, uh, uh, a horizontal pass in the red zone. But if that is the best solution to a problem, then they should have the, the courage to do it. Again, but being responsible. Um, we want to potentialize the player. We do not want to generate behavior based on fear. So instead of saying you will, if you lose the ball, they will score a goal, say what you do need. You need interaction. Keep focusing on the things that you need um, to, instead of, uh, instead of focusing on the negative. That is my, my advice. Um, so as I mentioned before, any training activity that you do in the zone, the cue is interaction and the training sessions should emphasize support, constant movement and creation of passing lanes. And I dare say even plenty of one-on-ones because those one-on-ones on the sides are, are, are key, especially when there is no coverage and the other team is pressing. The yellow zone, again, it was, it's very similar to, to defense because this is where all the transition takes place, right? So focus a lot of your training sessions on the yellow zone, lots of transitions. Before we discuss defensive transition, here we're going to discuss offensive transition. Whoever has the ball in this sector, dribble the ball with confidence. And when making a pass, do so with a high pace. Um, usually in this zone, we have, if we're, all, if we're attacking, the momentum is on our side. We might be in numerical advantage around the ball. We do not want to slow the game down. We want to accelerate. So if you're passing, pass that ball strongly to the open space. Um, whoever doesn't have the ball and is participating in the attack is not staying behind for the offensive coverage. Whoever is participating in the attack and does not have the ball, this is the time to make the court as big as possible. All the way to the sidelines when you are providing width. If you have a pivot player, all the way on the end line. Because if the other team is in numerical disadvantage, if they have less numbers than us around the ball, let's make that space as difficult as possible for, for them to defend. Um, basically providing space for the player with the ball to, to play with creativity. Once we increase the size of the court, now we support the player creating passing lanes for, for 2v1s. Um, and again, something that I said before, and I will keep on saying, if this doesn't, we, you, just because this is the desirable behavior for the yellow zone, it doesn't mean that it's the only behavior. So let's say we were in a situation of offensive transition. We were not able to progress Talking about the logic of the game, we were not able to progress into the opponent's terrain. We were not able to get any closer to the other team's goal. The other team recovered defensively and now they're structured. So now what do we do? We go back and we use, inside this zone, we use a behavior that we developed for the red zone, which is what? The interaction. Okay, they've recovered, so let's bring everybody back. Let's get numbers around the ball. Let's create numerical advantage around the ball. And then let's build up our, our attack again. Um, Again, higher focus and emphasis in training in this zone than in the other zones, in my opinion, plenty of transition activities. The cue for this zone, one that Coach Neto likes to use and that we use ourselves in our club, is to expand. So whenever you do your transition activities, tell the kids, expand, 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 stop the practice, show to them. If they are not all the way on the sideline, take them to the sideline, create rules within your training activity um that that will force them to make that space as big as possible uh for example when i am in my club in my training session when i have a large group of kids where i can create up to three teams um i create certain rules if i want to generate a specific kind of behavior that for example if the player does not get as wide as possible to the sideline if one player doesn't do it i take the whole team off and i put another player in so and i put another team in if i only have a couple of players out uh sitting on the sideline I wait for one player to not provide as much width or depth as possible. If he doesn't do it, I take him out and I put another player in. So now the players start uh, holding themselves accountable for implementing what we believe are the right actions and intentions for this zone. Lastly, the green zone actions and intentions of the offense. The priority is to shoot on goal, uh, prioritize the shot on goal whenever the opportunity is available. It seems like common sense, going back to the logic of the game once more. It seems logical, but that once you get into the zone to tell the kids that they need to shoot, uh, to make them understand that the priority here is to finish on target. But personal experience, 
I am sure that many of you have encountered that as well. There are plenty of players that get into the zone and they do not finish. Um, that could be due to poor behavior that they've developed in the past, or it could be out of a fear of missing a goal scoring opportunity, which that, is, that happens quite often. They miss a goal, and then as soon as they miss a goal, a team it is yelling at them. So create training, up, uh, training activities here that emphasize a lot of finishing. Then you can use the word, as you'll see down there, the cue for this area is finish, 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 finish. Um, and then hopefully in the game, when you go into competition, as soon as they get into the zone, this is what they're going to be looking to do. Remember, remind the children that dribbling moves are simply a tool to create a better opportunity to finish on goal. Dribbling is not more important than scoring goals. Uh, what wins game, what wins games are goals. So it's very important for the kids to realize that. I, there is the allure of beautiful dribbling moves. Um, there are plenty of, uh, of things that kids like to do when they're on the ball, especially the very skillful players. But it is imperative that they do not lose sight. They do not lose the uh, focus that we're, we, when we are here, we need to capitalize on those opportunities and, and finish. Um, if the opportunity to shoot on goal is not available, our feints are, are very handy in this situation. So feints, again, um, deceiving the defender. You know, it's a movement that we do with our body to make believe that we're going to go one way and come back and, and come the other way around. So with a feint, I can maybe generate a split second of time, um, maybe a, a couple of feet where I can create uh, enough space to, to shoot on goal. Back to what I was saying about rondos, many teams that, uh, that are very technical, that have a lot of very technical players that are comfortable in possession of the ball, it is common for these teams to get into this offensive third and also not finish on goal. They get here, they pass the ball backwards, they start building the play up all over again. So take those athletes, create training situations, training activities in, this, uh, in the zone, create rules within your activity that they do have to finish on goal to get them to develop the habit so that it becomes a, a behavior. And then you no longer will have to tell kids on the sidelines, finish, shoot. They will, once they get here, they will know that that's what they need to be looking to do. Um, also because we've seen, uh, I used to, I'll give you a personal account. I took a team to the World Futsal Championships last, uh, last summer uh, here in Disney. And I had a very skillful team at a specific age group. And we, we, there was one game where we had so much possession of the ball. And we always got into the offensive third. And this specific team, we were having a very hard time capitalizing the opportunities to shoot on goal. As soon as we got to the offensive third, sometimes we would play the ball back to the yellow, to the yellow zone. Um, so maybe it's something that I look back now and I try to change so that it doesn't happen again. I look back at the planning that we did for, for that specific team for that tournament. And now I realized, okay, maybe I should have trained the green zone with a little bit differently. Um, and then the cue again, finish. Before I, I, I leave you guys, I just want to say that the purpose of this, uh, of this model, it's not so that the players depend on us and our instructions. It's so that they rely less and less on us. And that is why we created this, is to facilitate their, their understanding, the learning process, so they can they recognize quicker where they are on the court and what's the, how, should they, how they should behave in that sector of the court. So again, question things. Um, the, the contact information that is on here is for Coach Vanildo Neto. Um, he, I'm actually going to bring him back to the conference in some days. I'll announce the exact date where he will be answering some of your questions in English. I will do the translation. I will go ahead and pass the information to him live. Uh, and then as soon as he replies, I'll translate it in English. So this is his contact information for those of you that speak Portuguese and are listening to this lecture. If not, I just want to thank you for your time. Question everything that I just said. Be skeptical, but dare to, to experiment. That is my advice to you. I did it. And it was one of the best decisions that I did as a coach, and now I get to sit here and have the privilege and the honor to lecture you about it. Thank you very much for, for your time, and I wish you enjoyed the, the rest of the conference. Take care.